Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you were with us at our last session, we were working in Ephesians 5. We've moved to Ephesians 6. And so turn to the book of Ephesians, to chapter 6, and let's start with verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye servants as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So he's kind of got it going both ways here, doesn't yes. he? Again, yes. not only with the family, but in this situation of slavery. And when your version says servant, the Greek word is literally slave. So it's talking about slaves. Once again, we need to understand something of the context. It is estimated that 60% of, of the people in the Mediterranean world in Paul's day were slaves. 60% were slaves. And you could become a slave in many ways. This is not talking about something that was a basis on, based on race or was a lifelong thing, maybe in a few cases. But in most cases, people got into slavery because they couldn't pay their debts. They Maybe uh, young girls would be sold into slavery to be temple virgins, if you will, almost like our sex trades are going on today. Uh, there were all kinds of ways you could get into so-called slavery in the society of those days. However, there were slaves who were very trusted. There were slaves who were trusted to look after the rich people's children, take them to school and bring them back home safely. There were, there were slaves who were private physicians for, for important families and so forth like this. There were lots of, of, of there was a huge variety, in other words, of slavery and, and what it implied and, and, and the levels at which they were respected and so forth. Um, often there were, there were bonds of the deepest loyalty and affection between master and slave. Pliny writes to a friend that he is deeply affected because of some of his well-loved slaves have died. He, had, he has two consolations, although they are not enough to comfort his grief. Quote, I have always very readily manumitted my slaves. Uh, that means he very he was he quite often just released his slave to to go away free uh, for their death does not seem altogether untimely if they have lived long enough to receive their freedom the other that i have allowed them to make a kind of will which i observed as rigidly as if it were good in law there the kindly master speaks so there were there were people who who respected their slaves and and treated them almost as if they were free people but the life of the slave was was totally, really without respect. I mean, literally, the master had the privilege of doing whatever he wanted with the, with the slave. Um, Varro, one of the famous Roman writers of long ago, said, for a slave is a living tool, just as a tool is an inanimate slave. Uh, another one, the articulate, uh, it talks about um, Writing about agriculture, Varro says, he divides agricultural instruments into three classes, the articulate, the inarticulate, and the mute. So can you guess which 
farm instruments he's talking about? Well, the articulate comprises the slaves, the inarticulate, the cattle, or the oxen, and the mute, the vehicles, or the, or the tools. The slave is no better than a beast who happens to be able to talk. Cato gives advice to a man taking over a farm. He must go over it and throw out everything that has passed its work, and old slaves, too, must be thrown out on the scrap heap to starve. When a slave is ill, it is sheer extravagance to issue, issue him with normal rations. The law was quite clear. Gaius, the Roman lawyer in the Institutes, lays it down, quote, We may note that it is universally accepted over the slave. If the slave ran away, at best he was, he, uh, at best he, he was death over the slave. If the slave ran away, at best he was branded on the forehead with the letter F for fugitivus, which means run away. At worst he was killed. The terror of the slave was that he was absolutely at the caprice of his master. Augustus crucified a slave because he killed a pet quail. Vidius Polio flung a slave still living to the uh, savage lampreys in his fish pond because he dropped and broke a crystal goblet. Juvenal tells of a Roman matron who ordered a slave to be killed for no other reason that th than that she lost her temper with him. When her husband protested, she said, You call a slave a man, do you? He has done no wrong, you say. Be it so, it is my will and my command. Let my will be the voucher for the deed. The slaves who were maids to their mistresses often had their hair torn out and their cheeks torn with their mistresses' nails. Juvenal tells the master who delights in the sound of a cruel flogging, thinking it sweeter than any siren song. Or, quote, who revels in clanking chains, or, quote, who summons a torture and brands the slave because a couple of towels are lost. A Roman writer lays it down, quote, whatever a master does to a slave undeservedly, in anger, willingly, unwillingly, in forgetfulness, after careful thought, knowingly, unknowingly, is judgment, justice, and law. How would you like to live under those circumstances? It's yeah. against that, go ahead. Those descriptions, um, how common are they? How can you tell how common they are? Well, I mean, like right now, let me give you for instance. Some people believe that the United States is completely racist, mm -hmm. that all the white people are racist. Some people say, no, they're not all racist. And some people say, well, there's just a few people that are racist. So it just depends, you know, who you're talking to, uh, how widespread a problem is like that. Mm -hmm. When you talk about slavery and how they were treated so badly, um, just how widespread was that? Because you got, back then you have a completely different economic system. Yeah. You don't have, you don't have um, such developed um, capitalism like we have now. You know, you have people that commit themselves that they'll work for so long, you know, to pay off debts and things like that. It's, 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 it's a commitment instead of paper, you know, type of thing. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if you can just look at this as a as a whole society with uh, with some people that have whips and sixty percent of the other people are, they're under the whip type of thing. I'm not quite sure if we ought to look at it that way. I think way. that was a good that's a good question, Gary. Uh, but the first example you used was one group of people how they thought about somebody else. But in the in Ken's uh, speaking of it, he was referring to the masters themselves who were admitting what they were doing and what the law should be. But how many of those were actually I, doing I it that yeah, way? I think that's what Gary is asking, is how do we, do, we have, well, do we have record that this was just pandemic in the culture? It's kind of like the evening news, or there's a disaster down in a square block, and by the time you're done, you think the entire town is wiped out. I, I, th I, think, I think the key thought here is that no matter how cruel you were or how kind you were, that's the authority that you had. Yeah. Well, an example of this is one time a, a slave got angry and killed his master, and according to Roman law, 400 other slaves in that same household were killed in compensation. 400 were killed, according to Roman law, to, to supposedly pay for the fact that this one slave had killed his master. Even if that were a, an extreme, 
the 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 mean the the average. the average would be a horrible situation even if it wasn't that violent but it wasn't just the lower echelons you look through the history of mm -hmm. all of the roman empress and you mentioned pliny pliny was lucky to live through domitian who yeah. was one of the most callous paranoid creeps that ever crawled this <laughs> earth yeah. and he killed people all around Pliny some of his friends he wasn't he was up in the higher levels of government but he wasn't in the in the in the uh, the the leaders family if you say and there were all kinds of families that fence not like British and German royalty went down they were fighting each other and killing each other mm -hmm. well but, you know this question may may play to um, the integrity of slavery mm -hmm. and how productive it is, how else would you control slavery? Yeah, right. well, that, you that's, know? That, was the, that was that, the thought of the masters. That kind of, a, that kind of an economy may lead to that very kind of a discipline. You, if you're going to have slavery, then that's the kind of a culture that's eventually going to, to emanate. So you don't want to have slavery. The question is, why didn't Paul say Christians are going to need to abolish slavery? Because they would never have made it. He knew that he could do better doing what he was doing. He couldn't. They were just a handful. They were outnumbered. If the people treated each other the way that Paul suggested, the, the effects of slavery would have disappeared well, into let's, oblivion. Let's explore that, and we're going we're gonna to jump out of Ephesians and Colossians for a moment and go over to the book of Philemon. Now, uh, Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon were all written at the same time, and they were sent by two men at the same time back to, well, to the places where they were supposed to go. So we're not, we're not picking out something completely strange. Philemon was written exactly the same time, and it was carried by the person he was writing about. This letter was his personal letter to his master. So let's, let's set the stage, first of all. Um, at some point in, in life, Philemon became a Christian. Philemon was probably a fairly wealthy man who lived somewhere in Asia Minor, probably in the city of Laodicea. We can't say that for sure, but there's some hints of that. Let's just say somewhere around Laodicea, Ephesus, Colossians, Colossae, somewhere in that area. But we're, we're going to favor Laodicea. We'll, you'll see why a little bit later. He had a slave, and that slave's name was Onesimus. Now, Onesimus was a common name for a slave because it meant useful. So there were quite a few slaves by that name. And apparently at some point in time, and again, we don't know exactly when this happened, we have no way of knowing when this happened. Onesimus decided to run away. He probably stole some property, maybe over a period of time we don't know, or maybe he took a whole bunch all at one time and just gone with it like that, and he disappeared. We know for a fact that there were wanted, dead or alive notices that were put out for slaves that were a runaway. We've already talked about what happens if, if they were caught. The very best thing that could happen is you'd be branded as a fugitive. The very worst thing that could happen is you'd be killed. Uh, w there was all, virtually no tolerance for, for s runaway slaves whatsoever. Onesimus apparently ran away to Rome, thought that in that huge city he could, he could get lost. And apparently he did. We don't know for how long. But somehow over there while he was in Rome, he ran into a group of Christians, perhaps, or maybe somehow or other he heard about Paul and decided to go talk to Paul. In any case, he became a Christian. And after being there in Rome for a period of time and listening to Paul, etc., Paul gradually, at some point in time, figured out what the story was with Onesimus and said, okay, Onesimus, the time has come for you to go back to your master. And Onesimus no doubt said, you know very well what's going to happen if I go back to my master. Why, why, did, why did Paul come to that conclusion? He said that was the right thing to do. Why We're going to talk about that in a moment. We're going to see what Paul says, so let Paul speak for himself, okay? <coughs> so Nesma says, you know what's going to happen to me if you send me back. And Paul says, no, we Christians are different. We don't treat our slaves the way other people do. Well, how, how, what's going to prevent that? And Paul says, I'm going to write you a letter, a short letter. I'm going to give it to you, and when you arrive at Philemon's house, you're going to hand him this letter. 
And I would like to read that letter. It's short. I'd like to read the entire letter. Uh, it's one page in my Bible, plus a, not even a whole page. Um, the little book of Philemon. From Paul, a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy. To our friend and fellow worker, Philemon. And to the church that meets in your house, and our sister Apphia, and our fellow soldier, Archippus. Now, we don't know for sure, but obviously it looks like uh, Philemon and, and Apphia were probably husband and wife. And there are those who suggest that the way it's worded, Archippus may have been their son who had decided to, be, to become an associate with Paul before he was imprisoned. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Brother Philemon, every time I pray, I mention you and give thanks to my God. Now, how does Paul usually start out his letters? He always tries to say some nice things about the people to whom he's writing, right? Yeah. Dear Brother Philemon, every time I pray, I mention you and give thanks to my God, for I hear of your love for all of God's people and the faith you have in the Lord Jesus. So he's saying what? Philemon, I know you are a good Christian, right? My prayer is that our fellowship with you as believers will bring about a deeper understanding of every blessing which we have in our life and union with Christ. Your love, dear brother, has brought me great joy and much encouragement. You have cheered the hearts of all of God's people. And Paul had already said that they had a church meeting in their house, right? Mm -hmm. So he's, he's sort of building the picture here, you can see. For this reason, what he's already said, I could be bold enough as your brother in Christ to order you to do what should be done. So is Paul leaving any questions about what he thinks should be done? No. <laughs> or, his, or his ability or his position in his relationship to Philemon. Yeah, exactly. I could order you to do what should be done. But because I love you, I make a request instead. I do this even though I am Paul, an ambassador for, of Christ Jesus. Now, your version may have an old man. Uh, appealing as an old man is one way. Appealing as an ambassador is another way. The two Greek words are very similar. We'll get, maybe get a chance to look at those in a little bit later. And at present, also a prisoner for his sake. So I make a request to you on behalf of Onesimus, who is my own son in Christ. For while in prison, I have become his spiritual father. So now what's he saying? If you do something you shouldn't do to Onis Onesimus, who are you hurting? Me. Me. This is my son, right? Well, not only that, but both of us. Wouldn't he consider Philemon in the same category? Wouldn't he consider Philemon as one of his sons? So yes. So he and Onesimus are now equal as far as Paul is concerned. Yeah. yeah. At one time, he was of no use to you. He's making a play now on his name. But now he is useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you now, and with him goes my heart. Oh boy, he's, he's laying it on here, isn't he? I would like to keep him here with me while I'm in prison for the gospel's sake, so that he could help me in your, in your place. However, I do not want to force you to help me. I, I don't want to order you to do what should be done, right? I don't want to force you to help me. Rather, I would like for you to do it of your own free will. So I will not do anything unless you agree. And maybe that Onesimus was away from you for a short time so that you might have him back for all time. See? Maybe it was a good thing that he ran away, right? And now he is not just a slave, but much more than a slave, he's a dear brother in Christ. And what would you do with a dear brother in Christ? Are you going to kill him? No. No. How much he means to me and how much more he will mean to you both as a slave and as a brother in the Lord. So if you think of me as your partner, okay, welcome him back just as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Oh, by the way, here I will write this with my own hand. I, Paul, will pay you back. I should not have to remind you, of course, that you owe your very self to me. Was Paul planning to pay anything back? <laughs> no, <laughs> he wasn't planning to pay a, a single penny. Um, so, my brother, please do this, do me this favor for the Lord's sake, as a brother in Christ, cheer me up. I am sure, as I write this, that you will do what I ask, 
In fact, I know that you will do even more. See, I'm sure of this. At the same time, get a room ready for me because I hope that God will answer the prayers of all of you and give me back to you. So what's he saying now? And I'll come check up on you. I'm coming <laughs> to check up on you. <laughs> exactly. That's not all. Epaphras, who is in prison with me for the sake of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings, and so do my co-workers, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Lucas. Luke, may the God, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So much for free will. <laughs> well, I love He's film. kind of the master psychologist and the master Christian all rolled into one, isn't he? He is, he really, yeah, very much so. Or a good lawyer, all of the above. Well, he, he played all his cards. Yeah. <laughs> right. So if, if Philemon was such an outstanding and magnificent Christian and mm -hmm. treated his slaves in such a magnificent Christian way, mm -hmm. why was it that Onesimus well, well, you know, I need to get out of here. There's a couple of explanations yes. for that. One, Onesimus may have been a very bad character back in the beginning. That's a possibility. He didn't care how good his master was. He just wanted to be out of there. There's also the possibility, very distinct possibility, that Onesimus ran away before Philemon became a Christian. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because that was going to be my next question. Yeah. If he was such a magnificent Christian, why was it that Philemon was so afraid to go back? Onesimus. Yes, Onesimus. Yeah, yeah. So much so afraid to go back. Okay, now there's another part <clears> of <throat> the story. There's two more parts of the story that uh, we need to look at. Go back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, and we're going to start with verse 15. Give our best wishes to the believers in Laodicea. Now this is the, this is the letter that's gone to Colossae, okay? Mm -hmm. Give our best wishes to the believers in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. And this presumably was the, at least one of the, of the congregations that met at Colossae. After you read this letter, make sure that it is read also in the church at Laodicea. At the same time, you are to read the letter that the believers in Laodicea will send you. Where is the letter to the Laodiceans? That's in Revelation. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different one. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Could that possibly be Philemon's? Well, why would you think that? Uh, this could be another way to make sure and safeguard. Okay, let's read it very Onesis. carefully. At the same time, you are to read the letter the believers in Laodicea will send you. In other words, I want you to read that letter. And what do we know about that letter? And tell Archippus. Where did we read about Archippus? In the uh, previous letter. The one to Philemon. Yes. Yeah. And it, there's a pretty good indication that Archippus might be the son of Philemon and Apphia, right? So, and tell Archippus, be sure to finish the task you were given in the Lord's service. With my own hand, I write this. Greetings from Paul. Do not forget my chains. May God's grace be with you. So Paul is saying not only that he used all of his psychology and all his influence he possibly could to get Philemon to do the right thing, he said, not only do you people in the church at Laodicea are supposed to read this letter, which I've written to Philemon, but this letter is supposed to be shared to other churches so that they'll be watching to see what Philemon is going to do, right? Mm -hmm. so not only am I going to come and check up on you, yeah. but I got all the other churches checks, coming. Checks and balances. <laughs> like I said, so much for free will. <laughs> <laughs> I have to defend the slave here. Yeah, okay. Because the notion that he, were, he had stolen something was running... There's n that is not here. I, I well, didn't Paul see says, that. if he's taken something from you, I will pay it back. Okay, let, let's, I'm going to read what I got from verse 18. Okay. In, uh, in the French, and, okay, in the French, well, I don't want to read it in French, but yeah. no one will understand. It's, it's a, if he has done you any wrong, the word wrong there is mm -hmm. tort, which, is, which come from the legal term tort, which is not a criminal act. Mm -hmm. It's a civil act. Mm -hmm. He ran away, the, the running away, uh, constituted a tort. So, and when Paul answers here and talk about, okay, if he was, if he, blah, 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 perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. This is the tort, the running away. Mm -hmm. Because once a slave runs away, that, that gives the master the right to kill him or do whatever. But the slave there is not stupid at all. There was a, let me see, there's a thing that allowed him to go to someone. If he, if he was supposed to just run and never come back, 
he is a fugitive, they could put the F on his forehead. However, if he goes to someone else that's able to write a letter for him and present him to his uh, master, then that's not, he's not a fugitive. And the master most often must accept him back. So I don't see, there's a lot of conjecture that's not there mm -hmm. for me. I, I agree with what you're saying. But in addition to after the tort, it says, or owes you anything. Yeah, he owes him if he's not doing his work, if he's not right. paying his well, debt for the time he or, was going, he owes. Or perhaps something else. We don't know. Yeah. But Paul's definitely covering all the bases. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the suggestion would be that the slave might steal something to pay for his journey to get where he's going. I mean, that's a possibility. Well, I, I think the biggest thing is that if you let your slaves run off and then yeah. they come back and treat it like nothing, well, then all the other slaves know. might take off too. Yeah. So that's something that needs to be dealt with. It's just like the IRS. I mean, what happens if you don't pay your, your taxes and everybody knows it and all of a sudden they just forgave them? Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to, everybody else is going to say, hey, why do I have to pay my taxes and he doesn't? Yeah. You know, it's the same thing. You've got to be consistent with everything or else people will run off. Well, it was, yeah, that kind of a thing could be a big problem, too, if you've got a house that's, uh, if you can afford 400 slaves and you got, <clears throat> then you've probably got silver candlesticks around and all kinds of things, all kinds of things. And you notice one day, you know, where's that? There's one of the candlesticks mixing on the fireplace. You have no idea how long it's been gone. You don't want it to continue. And... And and um, so how do you you know and how do you pin down who did it so you can isolate it so yeah. this slavery thing was just yeah well and I would suggest this um, and you know people say why didn't Paul speak up more forcefully about slavery I think through the book of Philemon he, he made it pretty clear if Christians followed his advice in the book of Philemon. Uh, slavery would st cease to exist am well, among slaves, uh, among Christians anyway. But there, there are, the big argument is why didn't he attack slavery as an yeah. institution? And, and and we can say Philemon does that. I'm not sure that was in the with Philemon. It, but not civilly. Right. But, uh, you know, I, th I think th to me the right answer to that is that uh, Paul didn't have time to do that. That was not his, that was not, you know, there comes a time when you just can't attack every evil that's around you. Okay. This is not the end of the story. We're just about to run out of time for, before our break. But it's very interesting. And, and the question which comes up next is, why is this tiny little personal letter to Philemon included in the Bible? And here might be the answer, very briefly. About 30 years, 40 years later, a bishop or a head of a church in one area of Asia Minor wrote a letter to the head of the church in Ephesus. And the name of the person who was the head of the church in Ephesus at that point in time was Onesimus. First bishop. So it's possible that Onesimus, and that, at that point in time, the Ephesian church was starting to gather all these letters of Paul together and putting together something like our New Testament. And Onesimus may have had a major hand in doing that. And this letter might have been included in our New Testament to justify the fact that this former slave is now one of the leaders of the Christian church. We don't know for sure that it was the same Onesimus, but at least we do know that Onesimus did that. So we're going to go back to Colossians when we come back. Don't go away.
We're so glad you decided to stay by. Welcome back. We're going to turn back now to finish up these three letters that were written together, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And we, we haven't had a chance to sort of finish up a few bits of the, of the letter to the Colossians. Uh, open your Bibles to Colossians, the first chapter, and we're going to start with verse 15. There are several passages in the Bible that talk about the, uh, the real pre-existence of Christ, his basic nature, uh, the fact that he was creator and so forth like this, his pre-existence, etc. And this is one of them. Look at these words in Colossians 1. Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn son. And by the way, the word firstborn there doesn't mean, you know, born of a woman as Jesus was even here on this earth. What this means is, the Greek word is prototokos, it means the, the eldest, the, mo the most important in the family. He's the head of the family. As the firstborn, he was the head of the family. For through him God created everything in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. Now the Colossians were, were starting to believe in uh, Gnostic ideas in which the, the God of heaven is so high up there and so pure and so holy that he can't have anything to do with the sin and the material world down below here. So they taught that, the Gnostics taught that that God actually created another, a little bit lesser God below him who created another lesser God below him and down, 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 down. Finally, you get down here to a God that's evil enough so he can actually create a material evil world. So, so this, is a, this is an offspring of that idea that anything that's spiritual has to be pure and holy and anything that's material, anything you can touch and actually feel has to be evil. The bottom line is, it destroys the nature of Christ. Yes, it destroys the nature of Christ. Well, and, and they, the Christian church argued about this for hundreds of years, because the idea was, if you have that basic idea back in your head, that, you know, nature, I mean, that material stuff is somehow evil, how can you have a, a, a God, a perfectly pure and holy God come down and live for even a period of time inside of a, an evil woman's body. Now, I don't mean to imply there's anything wrong with Mary, but I mean, basically their idea was, she's human, she's evil, by definition. And this, of course, was the, the reason for the Catholic uh, teaching of, of Immaculate Conception, that, that somehow by magic, well, by some miraculous process, Mary was born sinless. And she stayed that way, and so therefore it was all right for Jesus to be housed in her womb temporarily because she was a perfect and pure uh, woman. And that's why she has such a, a prominent place in, in Catholic teaching. You know, you go through all that, these ideas with all mm -hmm. the levels and everything, but it all boils down to a definition of evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's all the problem was. I mean, what was evil? Was it, was it actually a physical thing or or um, something spiritual that took you out of evil. Yeah. It's not really like that. That's mm -hmm. what needed to be redefined. Well, let's read on this, the rest of this passage. God created the whole universe to him and for him. So the idea that some lesser God way down line there created our world is absolutely forbidden by Paul's teaching, okay? Christ existed before all things. And in union with him, all things have their proper place. He is the head of his body, the church. He is the source of the body's life. He is the firstborn son who was raised from death in order that he alone might have the first place in all things. So Paul says, Jesus was not only the original creator of all things, he is the head of all which is redeemed. Firstborn from among, among the dead. He's saying, if, if you have been converted as a Christian, you have be joined the, the, the Christian family, you've been redeemed, then you are a part of this special family of Christ. Well, let's go back just a notch, just mm -hmm. for a second. You said that um, Christ was not underneath. You know, he wasn't, yeah. he wasn't lower level to, so he could create. Mm -hmm. But yet, um, we have the concept of the Father. Mm -hmm. So, 
that would suggest maybe something a little lower underneath Why? if they have well just because the father is the father and the son is the son. Just because of, it's a because of an a priori assumption that you already make and bring to that. No, 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 no. It's because of the symbolism. Because of the father no. and the son. That's what, that's what your a priori assumptions come from. they use that from. as a symbol. They use it as a symbol. What other symbol would you choose? Well, I don't know. I don't. I couldn't you use want one another to be symbol. And the other one to be why? No, no, no. I'm just saying. I'm just answering him. Yeah. You know why? Why does that even happen? They could be brothers. It, it's yeah, but brothers don't always get along that well. There's a thing called <laughs> sibling <laughs> rivalry. But but what I said, what I was bringing up in the first place, how does that erase? How does that erase the lower level part? Well. Well, unless, remember, the, unless the Gnostics, they're both the same. The Gnostics said, okay, here's this pure God up here, and then there's all these, they, were, they called them eons. These eons, these eons, these eons, all the way down. And finally, you get an eon down here quite a ways away from God, from the pure holy God up, up there. And this eon is, is evil enough so that he can actually create an evil world, the one we live in. So, we, so the alternative is to have one notch down instead of a whole bunch of them. No, 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 the alternative <laughs> is have someone who is creating everything. There's no distinction between the highest level and the bottom level. That's what he's saying. If I, okay. might, if well. I might say, Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if we read uh, the book of Isaiah chapter 9, unto us a child is born, and his name shall be Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Father. Mm -hmm. So they are truly, in fact, one and the same. So there is no notch down. The Father himself created all things. But Gary's question, I think, has some validity in that the word is used firstborn. Why would that word be used? It, it, and I think it was because it seems that the role of Jesus as archangel was to represent God as an angel to angels. And then he came to earth to represent God to humans as a human. And in that sense, he takes on a particular function in a particular point in time. And we could say he's the firstborn. He comes down here to represent humanity. He's the firstborn. It's loose language, but I think it gives a, a foundation well, for it. that one step good. further, That's good. what you said, now we're to worship in spirit. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, unless I go back, the Holy Spirit cannot come. Mm -hmm. And so now we're worshiping in spirit, with the spirit, with yeah. the Holy Spirit. Well, remember that the Greek word says nothing about birth at all. Prototokos, the, word, the Greek word, just means preeminent, the one who's first in place. It's the elder brother in a large family, and he's, he's looked to as the head of the whole family. That's, the, that's what originally meant. And, and whoever, the translators in English couldn't think of a better word that to use than, than firstborn. Whether, whether. So we have, the, we have the whole Godhead mm -hmm. represented, the yeah. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Doesn't, so, mm -hmm. Sorry. Doesn't mm -hmm. Jesus himself make distinction between himself and the Father throughout the New Testament? Well, he does during the time he's here on this earth because his father is still functioning as God in heaven. But he, although he's, he is God, is functioning as a human being here on this earth. So he does make a distinction during that period of time. Well, there is some thought that um, <clears throat> now that Christ has become at least part human, that, that uh, and some evidence to indicate that there, it seems like there's part of him that's going to stay that way. He's not going to return to, uh, to uh, totally what he was before. Is there a... Do you have any evidence to indicate in this transition from, from, I don't know, this is inadequate to explain it, but kind of a complete God to, to one where there's metamorphosed into having any sequential step? Is that, was there a process, a metamorphosis? Well, that, I mean, if it's some, I guess what I'm thinking is you find him, he he's, appears as an angel, described as an angel, and mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if, if that's ever been... Well, Anybody's ever proposed such early, a thing? Earlier, yes. Earlier in his existence, he was the first among angels. He was called Michael the Archangel. Michael is a word which means the one who is like God. He's an angel, but he's the one who's like God. 
So he was Michael, to the archangel, to the angels first, and later he becomes the elder brother to the human family for us. So yes, there's a kind of stepping down, if you will. Now that doesn't mean he's less God. It just right. means that his role has, in the Godhead, Christ's role has always been the role of representing the Godhead to his creatures. But there appears to be, certainly in his, in his human situation here, some, some kind of a physical transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is, is, there any, is there any evidence to indicate that, that there was a, 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 a kind of like a butterfly becomes something and then something else and something else before it becomes a butterfly or something? Mm -hmm. any, uh, this is pretty extravagant I, stuff. I, so maybe we're, know, we're departing from our theme here. It's the illustrations that bring things in. Mm -hmm. and, and when they start using illustrations, they're, they're only using parts of the illustration mm -hmm. you know, to, to make the point. But you, your mind can go on to the other parts, you know, and start adding those things in too. Or and it starts things. being a, it yeah. starts being very complicated. But, but well, l let us carry on. This isn't the time to get too far carried away. Uh, <laughs> John chapter one, the Gospel of John chapter one, the first four verses are very familiar. It's another place where it talks about Christ's role before he was here on this earth and what his position was in heaven. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. The Word was the source of life, and this life brought light to people, and so forth. Another passage which talks about this position of Christ is found in Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, look at that, Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, the first couple of verses. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets, but in these last days, He's spoken to us through His Son, or a Son. He is the one through whom God created the universe, the one whom God has chosen to possess all things at the end. He reflects the brightness of God's glory and is the exact likeness of God's own being, sustaining the universe with His powerful word. Notice here, it has him not only creating the universe, but doing what? Sustaining, Sustaining the universe with, the, with his powerful word. After achieving forgiveness for the sins of all human beings, he sat down in heaven at the right side of God, the supreme power. So uh, these are the major, there, there are other places where it t talks briefly, uh, Ephesians 2.10, Hebrews 11.3. Maybe we should look at Hebrews 11.3 just real quick. If I'm that, regarding Mary being a virgin, didn't mm -hmm. Jesus have older siblings? Well, he did, but uh, those were, as, as near as we can tell, there's different theories about this, but almost certainly those were, were children of Joseph, but not of Mary, from a, from a previous marriage. It is by faith that we under, I'm looking at Hebrews 11.3 now. It is by faith that we understand that the universe was created by God's word, so that what can be seen, that would be the material, was made out of what cannot be seen. And some might say, well, that's the spiritual, right? So again, Paul, I think Paul wrote Luke, or maybe with the help of, of I mean, if Paul wrote Hebrews, maybe with the help of Luke, uh, but he's, someone's trying to compare the, the physical with the, with the spiritual here. Well, anything that's mysterious is unseen, isn't mm -hmm. it? Maybe that's anything what, that yeah. anything that you don't know but is actually there is unseen. Yeah. And that can go for science. It could go for the spiritual aspect also. So it's not revealed and not very profitable to speculate on it. Maybe that's well, where. Uh, no, I think you can grow into it, but um, through knowledge. But maybe that's. Maybe that's the kernel of uh, the origins of Ellen White's comment, where she says God is not um, indebted to any pre indebted to pre-existing matter yeah. in the creation of the earth. Yeah. Kind of sounds. Uh, <coughs> one could draw some type of uh, similarity to the Big Bang. Well, <coughs> let, let's look at a little bit of that kind of stuff uh, and, and, and see. There was. Revelation 12, verse 7, and up to, especially up to verse 12, tells us that before this world was created, there was war in heaven. And who started that war? 
Lucifer. Lucifer, who became Satan with his group. And what happened to them? They were thrown down to this earth, which is very interesting because this apparently happened before our earth was created or our world was created, maybe I'd more correctly to say. Uh, what was he thrown down to? It was before our world was created. The abyss? Good without, question. Without form and void? We don't need to speculate, but it's something to ask to think about. And what was the result? Well, the, the followers of Satan had had lots of questions about God, and they were thrown out of heaven because they, they stopped trusting God. But the angels who were left behind, did they have any questions about God? Sure. Probably so. So we need to look at that in context. This world was created, before this world was created, all the beings in the universe lived together in peace and harmony. Sin began in heaven in the mind of Lucifer, the covering cherub, while at his position next to the throne of God. Over a period of time, he fomented dissent among the angels until there was war in heaven, Revelation 12, 7. A majority of the angels remained loyal to God, while about one-third joined Lucifer, Satan's side. While we do not know what uh, Lucifer, Satan said to the angels, it must have been incredibly deceptive and believable to get one-third of those holy, intelligent beings to rebel while living in God's very presence. Think about that. Don't you think that even the loyal angels were left with some questions in their minds? How were those questions, ans uh, those questions to be answered and those ac accusations to be dealt with? It was not until the death of Jesus on the cross and the opportunity to see Satan unmasked in his efforts on, in his attacks on Jesus that the loyal angels were completely clear about his true character and motives. But even then, there were some questions remaining which will be answered fully and completely before the end of the great controversy. And here's a comment from Ellen White in her book, wonderful book, Desire of Ages, about the life of Christ, page 764, paragraphs 2 to 4. At the beginning of the great controversy, the angels did not understand this. And it's talking about why sin was so dangerous and so forth and the fact that it would lead to death. Had Satan and his host then been left to reap the full result of their sin, notice result of their sin, they would have perished, but it would not have been apparent to heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. A doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds as evil seed to produce its deadly fruit of sin and woe. People would have said, well now hold on, look what happens to you if you get out of line. God's going to zap you. Whoa, you know, we better... I think that if we study the scriptures thoroughly from, from cover to cover, I think that we can come up with that same exact answer. Mm -hmm. Very well, apropos. Well, there was doubts back at the beginning. When the great controversy was ended, there won't be any more doubts. <clears throat> then the plan of redemption, having been completed, the character of God is revealed to all created intelligences. That's what the great controversy is all about, to reveal the character of God. The precepts of his law are seen to be perfect and immutable. Then sin has made manifest its nature, Satan his character. Then the extermination of sin will vindicate God's love and establish his honor before a universe of beings who delight to do his will and in whose heart is his law. Well then might the angels rejoice as they looked upon the Savior's cross, for though they did not then understand all, they still didn't understand everything, even after the death of Christ. They knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain that the redemption of man was assured and that the universe was made eternally secure. Christ himself fully understood, fully comprehended the results of the sacrifice made upon Calvary. To all these he looked forward when upon the cross he cried out, it is finished. What, a, what incredible, what an incredible situation really to think about that. Um, what lengths God has gone to to make sure that everybody has their questions answered, the accusations have been clarified in everybody's mind. We know that the guilty party is Satan and Satan alone. God hasn't done anything wrong. So now since everybody understands, we can get the execution out there and, and just <laughs> kill everybody off. No, you don't have to. Hmm? You don't have to. If everybody understands, but you don't have to. the question is still there that whatever kills them off 
is well, the truth, and the truth was created by God. What kills the moth is sin, and it's sin that, they, well, that they're sin? not willing to give up. Oh, what rebelliousness. Is sin? Rebelliousness. Lawlessness. lawlessness. Yeah. Separation from God, the source of life. So God's holding everybody alive right now, even though they're sinning. So he's going to have to disconnect that hold. So he's pulling the trigger anyway. Yeah. Well, you, you, ha you, you have to go there. And he takes that responsibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's no doubt he is maintaining us now as sinners. The day's coming when that's not going to happen. And he's the only one that can change that situation. But when he does the natural results take over. Mm -hmm. And that's the answer to the question. That the answer to the question is they okay die. Okay with, with the trigger being pulled. With his, with his not sustaining evil, the righteous say, it's okay. You don't have to sustain it anymore. Okay, uh, so the, pull it away. That's, well, exactly, no. that's right. Yeah, he's, it he's, is pulled away. I mean, no, no. If, he's, if he's doing it now and not doing it then, he makes a change. You can't get away from it. Yeah. Unless they're the ones who pull away from him. Well, they've already done that, but he's sustaining them in their yeah. pulled away situation. Yeah, that's true. Yes. In, in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 16, towards the, towards the end of 16, I'm sorry, verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Yeah. Well, there's one other major question that we need to deal with in the book of Colossians. If you read in the King James Version, I think you've got that norm, do you? Uh, no, I've got New King James. Oh, New King. Read the New King James for us, for Colossians 1.14. I know it'll take you a little bit of time to get there. I'm sorry, 2.14. Colossians 2.14. 14. You got it there? No, I didn't. C-O-L 2.14. Colossians 2.14. I'm going to oh, read... I know why. <laughs> I'm going to read Do here. It. Here in Colossians 2. I'm going to read from 12 to 14 just to get a little context, and then you can read us the 2.14 in, in the King James. For when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ, in baptism, you were also raised with Christ through your faith in the active power of God who <coughs> raised him from death. You were at one time spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were Gentiles without the law. Gentiles without the law. But God has now brought you to life with Christ. God forgave us all our sins, and then the key verse, he canceled the unfavorable record of our debts with its binding rules and did away with it completely by nailing it to the cross. And Colossians 2.14 in the New King James, yeah. blotting out the handwriting of ordinances yeah. that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. RSV, cancel, having canceled the bond which stood against us with its legal demands, mm -hmm. he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. So the, is it talking about all law? It's talking well, that's about the everything. Question. What's it talking about? Well, if, if I might, in the NIV, having canceled the written code, here, this might help with the answer, with its regulations. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't seem like it's everything. It's some written code with the regulations of that. But any code. kind of law you can think of will, will... Well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Many of our Christian friends, and if you look in commentaries, you'll see this. Many of our Christian friends says this is proof that the moral law has been done away with, and specifically they're trying to, to eliminate the Seventh-day Sabbath. And this verse is used as a way of getting rid of the Seventh-day Sabbath. Well, what does this verse really say? Well, the law, as, we, as Christ summed it up, is what? Love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do we want to get rid of that kind of law? No. James calls it the perfect law of liberty. Do we want to get rid of liberty? No. No. So, and, and Romans 13, 8 and 10 says, love is the fulfilling of all law. Do we want to get rid of love? No. No. So what's going on here? What is it that stood against us? And the answer is here, what stands against us is the handwriting, the chirographon. 
And that, the, the best way to figure out what that word is supposed to mean is to look back in documents from the same period of time. It turns out that in the Apocrypha, we don't believe that the Apocrypha was inspired, but there is this word used. And what happened was, the, the, this was a, a word that was used to describe a, uh, 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 something you owe. It's something, a debt. Uh, uh, Tobias took a bunch of money, he left it with his relative, he got this chirographon. He took it home. Many years, well, some time later, when things were really in bad shape, he told his son, he said, take this chirographon and go and get our money back, because we need it. So what kind of a debt do we owe to God? That was, it sounds like something in the nature of a, ba a bailment. There, he, he yeah. gave the, the he had a receipt, yeah. and the and the people that had the his what he put on deposit, they had a duty to restore that back to him when he wanted it. Mm -hmm. Well, this apparently this obligation was done away with, yeah, because of of the, the law stands there and it spells out exactly what we're supposed to do. How often do we do it? One hundred percent. So what stands against us is actually our infractions of the law, our failures to keep the law. Our record. Our records. So what's, what's in trouble, what causes the trouble here is those, that list of our sins. So what Christ does is he does what? He says, that list of sins doesn't matter anymore. If you've chosen to follow me, you want to be like me. So what's done away with, what's nailed to the cross, if you will, are all our sins. Our, here's the law, here's the cross, and if you will, like to say, uh, behind and above the cross or attached to it would be the law. And what's buried with it is all the records of our sins. <clears throat> That's what's done away with here when it talks about the unfavorable record of our debts with its binding rules. And if I might add, and, and I agree with that, that we know the issue you said earlier was the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Many want to get rid of that. Well, we know that wasn't Paul's issue here because yeah. in Hebrews he clearly says yeah. there therefore remains a Sabbath yeah. day's rest. Anyway, we've, we've run out of time. We thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.